It's late summer 1940, early days at Camp 020, the British Spy Interrogation Centre, where, despite the raging death and destruction of World War II, the head of the camp, Tinai Stevens, has ordered that no physical violence is to be used to break the subject. Suspect German Nazi agents. On this day, the head of MI5's four more brutal POW interrogation operations, Alexander Scotland, is visiting to interrogate a suspicious Danish man. The Dane resists Scotland's attempts to break him. He insists he is innocent and gets argumentative. Scotland, frustrated, strikes the Dane in the face. The Dane, not boned or hobbled, hits back and a scuffle ensues. Tin Eye's men break up the fight, throw Scotland out and return to torturing the Dane psychologically instead. Many days later, he finally breaks and becomes the first double agent in the British double cross system, a very successful and quite enthusiastic agent for the British at that. But why? He was a convinced Nazi, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And the reason why he finally broke and then stayed loyal tells us a lot about the nature of people and espionage. I'm Astra Deinhardt. I'm Anna Deinhardt. And this is an episode of Spies and Ties, a series of World War II in real time. Hello, darlings. Spies. They are weird people. On one hand, they're obviously brave, heroic, and somehow spectacular. On the other hand, they're by definition dishonest and don't think twice about betraying other people. The kind of person anyone sane wouldn't want is a friend. No. Well... Especially if there were double agents. Perhaps that's why many of them who survived their service in World War II end up fading away into lonely, sad existences. Few, if any, end up staying employed in intelligence. One would like to think that those who betrayed the Nazis did it because they believed it was the right thing to do. Right? Sure. And some of whom we have already met so far in this series, like Tricycle or Lily, most certainly did it for the reason. But for others, the story is less honorable, or at least less round. Meet Wolf Dietrich Christian Schmidt, Agent Tate. His story begins in Denmark, where he is born in 1911 by a Danish mother and a Prussian father. His mother dies when he is only eight, and his rather strict, very Prussian father dominates Wolf's childhood. Wolf is a man of modest height, very normal looking. He is well-mannered, an enthusiastic horseman, has a practical mind and a vivid sense of humor. He does his mandatory military service at the Danish Hussars, where he performs fairly well and enjoys it. Even plans to make a career of it. His father has other plans though. He wants his son to be a farmer. And if it would ever be military, it has to be Germany. By now, Schmidt Sr. has remarried and moved to Berlin. It's 1931 and Schmidt Jr. is not yet 21 years old, legally not an adult, and still obliged to do as his father says. So, when the mandatory military services ends, off to agriculture school it is. He hates it, but while he's at school hating it, the Nazis seize power in Germany, for whatever reason. I can't tell you, Wolf doesn't hate Nazism. He thinks it's cool and eventually joins the Nazi party. To make a long and probably quite boring story short, despite everything, he eventually graduates as an agriculture specialist, but has a hard time finding work in Germany. Instead, he goes to Argentina, which I totally get, where he also finds it hard to make ends meet. So. He returns to Germany, where he joins the Nazi neo-colonial movement. In 1936, he goes to British Cameroon to work for the company Afrikanische Frucht to help grow bananas on German-owned farms. 
Finally, he is making money and making friends, some of them British. So, his English improves. But his friends in the Nazi party soon spoil the fun by starting a world war. And the Germans are thrown out of Cameroon. But Schmidt is a Danish citizen, so he stays behind. Which is a terrible idea since the German company he works for is no longer there and can't or won't pay him. So he's broke again, but manages to somehow get back to Germany and Hamburg where he's still broke, but now without any prospects. But then things pick up for our Danish friend when the German invade his home country in April. The German intelligence, the Abwehr, hear of his multilingual Nazi Dane. And they offer him money to go spy on his own countrymen to work out who might have contacts to the British enemy and such things. He is apparently quite good at that and the Abwehr decides that he must go to Great Britain as Agent Leonard. On September the 19th, 1940, after a crash course in espionage, he's in a Heikel 111 and strapped to a parachute. He gets down quite all right, only slightly wounded, and at first things look like they're going pretty well. Except they're not going well at all. He's been betrayed and after less than 48 hours he's arrested in a pub when he is identified by the fact that the limping man who calls himself Harry Williamson has a really funny accent. The MI5 have been looking exactly for that kind of man. After Schmidt's friend and fellow Abwehr agent, who was supposed to join in England, has betrayed him. You see, his colleague, Swedish journalist Jösta Karoli, also caught right after his arrival, cracks pretty much right away under MI5 interrogation and spills the beans on everything. But before he does, he strikes a deal with Tin Eye Stevens that they will spare Schmidt's life if he gives up. Except that's not what MI5 tells Schmidt when he arrives at Lechmer House, Camp 020, on September 21st. They simply tell him Caroli has sold him out and show him an alternate confession without the deal. But Schmidt doesn't crack. He insists he's just a Danish businessman trying to flee the Nazi occupiers of his home country. But MI5 know from Karoli that Schmidt has been spying on British military contacts with Denmark. And that is what leads us to the scene between Scotland and Schmidt. Now follows the long and tedious psychological terror that we saw in our episode about Tinai and Camp 020. But Schmidt still doesn't crack. He gradually softens, though. According to his own account, it's thanks to the evening spent in his cell, chit-chatting with the camp psychiatrist Dr. Harold Jeerden over whiskey. Yes, they're actually just having friendly chats and drinking whiskey, all a part of Tin Eyes and Dr. Jeerden's good cop, bad cop tactics, of course. Later in life, Schmidt will also tell a close friend, Reuben Allison, that he gains respect for Tin Eye and his remarkable insistence on known violence. So he stops being a Nazi, right? No. Alison will insist that Schmidt never fully stop being a Nazi. And there's no indication from any records that he disowed the Nazis. It was something much more personal that finally cracked him. So what's the straw that breaks the camel's back? The usual thing. Well, while he's being interrogated for days on end, he's isolated from other prisoners. And the MI5 never tell him of the deal that they made with Coroli. Instead, they threaten to execute him. And that's when he cracks to save his own life. Okay, sure. But he's also going to tell of how he felt betrayed by the Abwehr for receiving miserable training. When he arrives in England, he hasn't even been given proper training in the non-decimal British money system and imperial measurement. You'd think that would be the sort of thing you work out on your own, though. Not too smart, our Danish friend, is he? Well... His later ex-wife will say that despite his charm and vivid sense of humor, he was not a very intelligent man and only cared about himself. But 
an ex-wife might not be that reliable as a character witness, so that whole story about bad training might be somewhat of a post-construction. Speaking of humor, that's how Agent Leonard gets his MI5 code name. When Dr. Dearden presents his psychological evaluation, he points out Schmidt's fine sense of humor and allegedly Tinai responds. I have always wondered whom he reminds me of, but when you mention the humor, I know who it is. It's Harry Tate, the comedian and the musical entertainer. So Tate it is. And to crown the irony, they used the Tate Gallery Art Museum as a drop in his communication with other Upwear agents who also get caught, of course. But catching other agents is only a small part of the wonders Tate does for the British. He stays Leonard to the Germans and fields them an enormous amount of disinformation. From October until the end of 1940 alone, Leonard alias Tate sends at least 38 reports on his superior to the Abwehr. He reports on the effects of the Blitz, British <clears throat> morale, civilian evacuation and lots of other issues. However, always carefully guided by the MI5. The Germans love him, calling him their Perle, Pearl or Gem, if you like. After only six weeks of operations, he's even awarded the Iron Cross second class. In absentia, of course. He'll even be awarded a first-class Iron Cross, but he'll never get them. They're still in the MI5 Museum in London. And despite that he reportedly doesn't abandon his political views, he goes beyond being a tool for deception and becomes an active participant. He debates with Tar Robertson, head of the Double Cross team and other MI5 officers, what to include in the messages, how to maintain his cover and how to best cultivate his persona as the supposedly loyal German affair agent. And they also plot how to coax the German intelligence out of their funds. Yes, he tells the Germans that he's running out of cash. He needs lots of money if he's going to uphold his alias of being a rich playboy able to hopnob with the inner circles of the London elite. The Abwehr agree to send an agent with money. And Tate will meet him at the Tate Gallery, of course. But the man the Germans sent in, Karel Richter, is arrested by chance only three days after landing in the UK. And MI5 will let the Germans find out. Which presents an opportunity to scam even more money of the Abwehr, Tate. Well, no, Leonard pretends to blow a fit at his German superiors and in August 41 they're conned again in Operation Midas, this time also involving double agent Dusko Popov, codename Tricycle. In all, the Germans sent $40,000, over a million in 24 value, that the MI5 simply pocket. Yep. Yup, <laughs> Schmidt doesn't get any of it. His life as a double agent is far from being as exciting as his playboy alias pretend life. As a German spy who hasn't even given up his Nazi convictions, he's not free to roam around. He's under constant supervision and his daily life is quite mundane, even boring. Things get a little better when he's transferred to a safe house in Roundbush, where he even lives with Tar Robertson and his family. Here, he lives under the assumed name Harry Williamson. He is well liked and pretty comfortable. Not everything is smooth sailing though. One day he overhears Mrs. Robertson and the nanny discussing what would happen if the Germans ever come to England. And the nanny rapidly says, I wonder what would happen if a German agent fell down from heaven and turned up here. Tate bursts in, imitating a nasty German agent. <laughs> the unknowing nanny finds this hilarious. Miss Robertson, aware of Tate's background, is not amused. No. <laughs> Through all of this, Tate continues his work playing essential parts in deception for the campaign in Africa, Italy and Normandy, and so on. He sends over 1,000 false messages during his incredibly long career as a double agent. 
The last one, as late as May 2nd, 1945. And yet, by his own admission, he never stopped believing in Nazism. But he does say that seeing England not at all on the verge of moral, physical and economic destruction as the Nazi in Germany painted her, does convince him that Germany can't win the war. Which fits with what he will say himself was the reason for turning self-preservation. Nothing more, nothing less. After the war, he will stay Harry Williamson, attain British citizenship, discover his passion for photography and become a professional photographer. He will live out his life rather reclusively in Spartan, dutifully keeping his past identity secret until he dies of natural causes on October 19th, 1992. By then, he will have married and had a daughter. But in a twist, that makes his self about Nazism even more enigmatic. His wife will leave him due to his many sexual affairs with other men, and his last partner, with whom he will live until he dies, will be another man. What a strange war this is, and how baffling the world of espionage is, right? Totally. And to see the whole story of Ten Eye Stevens and Campo 2O, click right here. And the reason we can do all these wonderful videos is really simple. It's the participation of all of our Time Ghost Army members, right? So, join at timeghost.tv or at patreon.com and we will see you next time. Darlings. 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 Ooh. Mm -hmm.